Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ali Beg's ABTV here live on YouTube. Today is Gothenburg Day. It is the greatest day in our club's history. The day we beat Real Madrid to win the Cup Winners' Cup. The 11th of May, of course, is a very special date in the history of our football club. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you're going to enjoy the preview show ahead of tonight's game against St. Johnston at McDermott Park. We'll bring you the team news for that very, very shortly. And I have two very special interviews coming up later, one with a filmmaker and one with a goal-scoring hero, which is an interview you must not miss. If you want to get involved, drop me a note. Let me know everything that's going well because we are streaming for only the second time live. So I hope there's no gremlins and I really hope you enjoy the show tonight. So, St. Johnston, our penultimate game of the season is coming up at McDermott Park. Kickoff, 1945. There's a host of other games tonight as well. Dundee United take on Celtic. Celtic are sure to win the championship. Motherwell against Hearts. Aha. Uh -huh. Us against St. Johnston. St. Mirren against Livingston. And there was one result last night. Dundee beating Hibs 3-1. So this is what it means to the bottom of the table. Just the two games left. Let's hope we have a good performance tonight and a decent performance against St. Mirren on Sunday to finish our campaign. Really looking forward to seeing what could happen later tonight at McDermott Park. Kickoff 1945. Let's bring you the team news because the gaffer has made three changes from the game at Easter Road. So, Johnny Hayes goes out. In comes Adam Montgomery. Marley Watkins has a slight niggle. In comes 19-year-old Michael Ruth for his first Don start. This is his fourth first-team appearance. So looking forward to seeing what he can do tonight. And Ross McCrory is out because of concussion protocol. In comes Funzo Ojo. So I think that this is roughly what he will play tonight, Jim Goodwin, in this sort of formation. Obviously, let's just wait and see what happens. But I'm guessing this is where we are tonight. So just to confirm, three changes. Our head-to-head -head against St. Johnston this season has been indifferent. We lost the first game at Pataudry. We beat them in Perth. And in the last game back in February, we finished with a 1-1 draw. Here's some stats for you ahead of tonight's game. St. Johnston have only won one of their last seven league games against Aberdeen. Aberdeen are unbeaten in the last... 10 away league meetings with St. Johnston, but the Dons have won just one of their last 16 midweek league matches, which includes no wins in the last nine. So obviously we're looking for an improved performance tonight. Important, I keep saying it, but it is important to finish the season strongly. I was slightly surprised. I don't know what you guys think. Maybe you can drop me a note and tell me what you think. I suggested that I felt that Christian Ramirez needed to play all of our last three games purely because of confidence. Now, I understand why Jim Goodwin has allowed him now to go away, get his head right, get totally fresh for pre-season. But I can't help but think that when a lad is... His confidence is not good. The last thing you want to do before the end of the season is just say to him, right, fella, you're not in my plans. Just go and have a holiday. I think he should have been in tonight and I think he should have been in against St Mirren. But hey, that is just my humble opinion. OK, so let's have a little look and see what the manager has actually had to say pre-match. As always, plenty to say. There's always something on the line. There's always something to play for. There's professional pride at stake. We want to win the last two games to try and finish the season in as high a position as possible. So, let's see what happens a little bit later tonight. Three changes to the team that drew against Hibs. Today is Gothenburg Day. It is the best of days in my football life. It's just a memory that I don't think will ever fade. I was very fortunate to be in Gothenburg as a 10-year-old and... It's just a blessing that I was there. I'm so grateful to my late parents for organising the trip to take me, my best friend Ewan Taylor at the time, 
and our neighbours. It was just the best trip ever. And your social media action interaction today has been absolutely superb. I've loved all of the interaction on Twitter and Facebook today. So many of you are reminiscing about what was a sensational night in Gothenburg this day, 39 years ago. Next year, it's the 40th anniversary. Where, where does the time go? Now, earlier this evening, Chris Smith, who's a filmmaker, he premiered his brand new Gothenburg Tales movie on YouTube. Chris has a fascinating story. Check him out on, on the internet. It's an incredible story. He travels all over the world with his family, got stuck in lockdown in Nepal, couldn't get out. It was just an incredible story. So while he was doing that, he made a movie about Gothenburg, where his father and his uncle took the trip to watch his beat Real Madrid. Now, earlier today, I caught up with him where he is now in Mexico to talk about his movie. And this is what he had to say. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for being with me today. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you and many, many congratulations on the film. How's it been received so far? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ali. It's been, it's been brilliant, to be quite honest. You know, some of the interest that I've had from people from here, there and everywhere coming to me, people from home, people from abroad, you know, it's, it's great when, when this time of year comes around, it gets the whole kind of Don's family together, doesn't it? And uh, we can uh, celebrate, especially after the season we've had, everyone wants to have a little smile on their face. So, no, I'm chuffed to bits. It's, it's been great, yeah. What inspired you to make the film? There's quite a few things. Um, I've been interested in video before, and it's now what I kind of do as a freelancer. But for the passion project, um, it's something that I've had in my mind for a while. And um, what actually got me thinking about it, there, there's a guy on um, Twitter called, it's Kieran Fowler. He won't know this, so if he's watching your program, he's, he's finding out right now. But um, he put one out about a year or two ago about European nights, and I think it was with his father and uncle. Um, and I watched it, and I was like, that's brilliant. I says... I've got to do that. I've, I've got to create, I've created quite a few home movies for family, for their um, like weddings and um, birthdays and whatnot, retirements. And I just thought, I love trying to um, take stories, especially from my family, to then have them, create them. And then you've got them for the rest of your days. They can be passed through down through generations. And that Gothenburg trip was such an important one that, uh, yeah, it was something that I thought I've got to do this. So, How long did it take you to make and produce Okay, so that's a bit of a tricky one. So um, going back a step, we'd been, we, we travel full time. So when I started, um, we were in lockdown in Nepal um, and I started putting it together because I finally had the time. We ended up managing to get back to Scotland after a number of months and other things took over. So I had a break of probably three or four months where I didn't do anything on it. Now we're back in our travels again. We've settled down somewhere in Mexico and I managed to, to get after it the last month or so. So over the course of probably eight months, but realistically, it probably took me, uh, yeah, probably a month or two chipping away at it for sure. Um, learning a, a lot of new tricks along the way, which is which is always what I'm trying to do. So, yeah, it's been a labour of love, that's for yeah, sure. I can imagine. Did you go to Gothenburg? I did not. I'm disappointed <laughs> and disgusted in my father and my uncle. That they uh, didn't take me along. I, I was I was the grand old age of four at the time. Uh, I was turning five that year, um, but uh, quite understandably they, they didn't. Although I do, it's one of my earliest memories is remembering my old man coming back in the street in West Hill with a flag above his head, drunk as a skunk, you know, coming home. And yeah, all these years I've 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 wished that I could have went along, but I think I was just that little bit too young. Yeah, never mind. Never mind. Um, okay, just to finish off, what's your hopes and ambitions for this film? Um, I just, it's always scary. You'll know yourself. It's always scary putting yourself front and center to put yourself out there and, um, you know, stick yourself in front of people is not somewhere that I always like to be. I like to be behind the camera. That's why I create the movies. Um, but, it, but it's something that, that means so much to me and my family and a massive piece of history for all Don's fans as well, and um, that I just really hope that people can sit down, enjoy it, and go, the boy done good, mm. and they enjoy the film. That that would be that's that's all I want. <laughs> good man. 
Fantastic. Listen, many congratulations. I watched it earlier when you put it on. It's a brilliant watch, mate. Many, many congratulations. And I really hope it inspires you to do many more. Listen, all the very best in Mexico. Lots of love Thanks to the family. Take care, mate. Cheers. There you go, Chris Smith, all the way from Mexico. Now, if you want to follow up Chris online, check out his website, please, because he's he's such a talented guy. Three W's, kpsmithfilms.com. He's also on social media at kpsmithfilms. So get in touch with him. His Gothenburg tale is absolutely sensational. It's on his YouTube site now. It's all on there for you to watch. It was just a fabulous watch. So Chris, if you are watching tonight, many congratulations. It was a brilliant, brilliant watch. Okay. Now, you know I mentioned earlier that I went to Gothenburg. Well, I'd like to show you some of my father's home movie. He took this on his old cine camera. My late father, that's me, predicting a 5-0 win for the Dons. That's my pal Ewan Taylor sitting next to me. My father actually organised a number of charter flights to come out of Dice to go to Sweden. And look at this. These are actual shots from inside the cockpit. Can you imagine that in this day and age? So the captain allowed my father to come in and to film from the cockpit. This is us literally landing in Sweden. So at this point, don't worry, my father wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't standing up at this point. He was very well much strapped into the jump seat. But there we are. Getting taxied in. Honestly, what a day. This is even before the rain started. You'll see that in a short while. And here's some of the fans getting off the flight. Donned in their red and white. I'm sorry for the poor picture quality, but, you know, this is now 39 years old and it's been converted from cinefilm to DVD to this system now. And that's me. Getting off the flight. 10 years old on the 11th of May, 1983. And there we are in Gothenburg city centre with all the other gang from the aeroplane, honestly. What a day it was. <laughs> Some of the banners were just sensational on the day. Now, let's catch up now with goal scoring hero John Hewitt. I was absolutely thrilled to have spoken to John and I asked him to clear up a myth to start the interview. Clear up a myth. Is it true or isn't it true that Sir Alex was contemplating actually hooking you just after you came on. <laughs> He's, he was, what actually happened was, right, when he said to me, uh, when I, I went on, he wanted me to stay right up the, pe the pitch, to keep a length of the, of the pitch. Because I, I was fresh and I had the pace, you know, that the guys would be knocking it in the channels and I, I would be sort of spinning out and taking it, you know, running into the channels, allow the back four to squeeze up the park. But I was never ever getting in, involved with the game, you know, and I was getting agitated. I was trying to look for the ball. It wasn't coming. So I found myself drifting further and further back, you know, to get myself onto the park. Well, that's when he was shouting, Hewitt, get up the effing park. <laughs> so he did. He did pass a comment. He says, I was ready to hook you, you know, and I says, oh, well, if you did, you wouldn't have won a cup. So, um, but no, no, uh, it was, as I say, once I, I got myself in and started to find my feet, because it was difficult, because it was you couldn't run with the ball because it was sticking at your feet all the time, you know, because of the water on the, on the pitch. So you had to sort of basically run into space and try and get people to knock the ball into space so you could get yourself onto it. Okay, let's talk about what is obviously the greatest moment for, for me personally, and I think for millions of other Aberdeen fans around the world, your winning goal. I want to go right back to the beginning when Peter Weir nicks the ball. He then comes inside and he goes outside again. Can you give me your thought process when you see Peter Weir doing what he does just before he played that ball into the channel for Mark McGee? Just tell me what's going through your mind in that moment. I, I was just basically like probably the rest of the teammates focusing on watching Peter see what he was going to do with the ball, you know, and you're right, 
he beat two or three players, clipped a beautiful ball down the left wing, and Mark had made the run out to get himself onto the ball, you know. So, as you can imagine, I was sort of tearing down on goal with no marker, which I found quite hard to believe. Mark's got himself out in a, in a left wing position. And I was sort of looking at the goal, but also looking at Mark, you know, in, in the wide left area, because Mark had a tendency at times to beat a full back or beat a player, but double back and try and beat him again, you know. So I wasn't sure if he was, when he sort of touched it to the side, if he was going to play the early cross in or if he was going to take another touch and turn back in again and try and beat him. So it was one of these things. I'm looking at the goal, I'm looking at Mark, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, and I'm still gathering sort of momentum towards their goal. And then I just saw him take a touch to the side and I knew he's got to play the cross in. So I, I started to make a move. And I was I was astonished that the goalkeeper was basically rooted to his line, you know. I, I, I don't know if he had a lapse in concentration or whatever, but he was rooted to his line. And when the ball started to come across, when he started to move, I knew it was by his hands. So basically, I just really had to fall on top of the ball, you know, let it hit my head and, and direct it into the empty goal, which I did, you know. And that, that was it, you know. I, I, I was no, nothing more to it. It was as simple as that. It's, um, I still, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it now. It's just, it's an unbelievable moment. And the, um, the celebration, how often over the years have you taken stick from your teammates for that celebration? <laughs> yeah, I still get stick to this day, you know, uh, uh, about doing the Highland Fling, as they were saying. So, uh, again, I, I don't know. I mean, as I say, I picked myself up. I was, my hands were covered in mud, so I sort of wiped my hands and my shirt and I sort of run across to the side to acknowledge the fans and then Big Doogie assaulted me and then after that I don't really much, I remember much, you know, but um, it was it was great, obviously I scored at a time, I, I wasn't aware that it was going to be the winning goal, you know, I just knew that I'd put us 2-1 in front, you know, and can we hold on to that lead, can we extend it, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure at the time, but everybody was giving their all because obviously there wasn't that long left in the match, you know. Their free kick right at the death. Did you look or did you turn away? No, I was in the wall. I was You're in the, the wall. As soon as I was in the wall, yeah. As, as soon as it flew past the, the outside of us, I, I glanced and I just saw Jim diving and I thought, oh no, but it just, it, I mean, if that was the back post, it basically shaved it outside of the back post. It was so close, you know, but it was like oh, huge sigh of relief. <laughs> you know, I just thought, oh, no, but it, obviously it went wide, you know, and we, we knew then when once Jim took the, uh, the bye kick that hopefully the referee was going to blow for time, which he did, you know, so. But then he blew for time. Who were you, yeah. Who were you closest to and who did you celebrate with first? Ali, I honestly can't remember. I would have to go back and look at the video <laughs> to see, you know, but it was one of these things, you know, whoever was closest to you, you were arms were around each other and everybody was so elated with what we'd done and it was it was crazy. I mean, I remember um I think Big Ben sort of knocked Fergie to the floor and he, he came out of the dugout, you know, and it was a scramble, but it was just it was just pandemonium on the pitch, you know, because we'd won the game. Can you recall what Sam said to you when he first got to you? Do you, do you remember that? I, again, I, I honestly, I, I couldn't tell you because it the was emotion, just one right? of these things. Yeah, every, every, everybody was sort of running about and congratulating one another and hugging one another. And, you know, it was just, it, it just seemed to pass so quickly. How did it sink in? It sunk into me the, the following day when we came back to Aberdeen. You know, after the game, um, when the wives came on our, our bus and then we all went back to the Farzat Motel. I mean, a little, I mean, the wives, they were staying in the Europa Hotel in the centre of Gothenburg when, when they came across. So they were having a, a right ball of a time, but we were out in the middle of nowhere, you know. So after the game, they came back with us. Um, we had a meal with... Uh, 
the, the full squad, the directors, everybody that was there. But it was very low key, you know, because I say, horrible night. We had a, an early morning flight. I think it was about nine thirty. We were flying back the next day. Uh, some stayed up. Some obviously went to bed. I, I do recall at one point looking out. Um, of my, the room window to see it was Mark and Gordon Strachan uh, still with their gear on on the springboard and it was beautiful sunshine outside you know so they obviously hadn't been in their bed but um, oh, it was it was great it was so 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 good but getting back to when it sunk in you know we, we flew back to Aberdeen and then when we landed there was people standing on the roof of the airport um, and then from there on in, once we boarded the bus, we, we, we came back uh, in through Boxburn up uh, North Anderson Drive. And then we got to where the, it was the Egg and Dart at the top of Queen's Road, then turned on Queen's Road. Now, there's loads of people lying in the streets here. I know it was just thousands and thousands of people. But when we got to the top end of Union Street at the junction, and we just sort of turned, I mean, the bus was probably doing about two mile an hour, you know, it was just crawling. When we just turned the corner, that's when it hurt, really hurt me, just what we'd achieved, because you couldn't see Union Street. I must have been a quarter of a million people on Union Street that day. And there was people hanging out office windows, you know, from both sides of the street. It was just a sea of red and white and, and people, you know, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. And then that's when I started to think, God almighty, just what, what would achieve the night before, you know? Obviously, you, you received all the plaudits for, for scoring the winning goal, super sub, all that kind of stuff. But what I found really interesting when we met a couple of years ago when we did the blog together was that you were, you were quite determined to let me know and the readers of my blog know that this wasn't about you. This was about a team and a, a group of guys that had been together for a wee while. Why was your bond so tight, John? I think all about the manager, Ali, you know, when Alex came to the club, you know, he, he he told everybody he was a winner, he wouldn't accept nothing else than winning. If you weren't a winner, there was the door and on you go, you know. So um, he installed discipline, which was very good. Um, good habits, you know. Training with him and Archie was excellent, you know, they were so thorough on were opponents. Every time we played a European tie, they would watch their were opponents. They had dossiers on everybody, individuals from the goalkeeper right through. Day before the games, we would sit in the dressing room after training, go through the whole dossier, and then he would explain where he felt their weaknesses were and their strengths were, and how we would combat that to, to play against them to hopefully go on and win the match. So, uh, very very thorough, you know, uh, Alex and, and Archie, but. Um, it was just a special group of guys, Ali. You know, we used to meet up once every, once a month on a Sunday. Uh, Alex would give us a Monday off, so it was uh, egg and dart. We'd go have, have a bit bite to eat, watch a football, a few beers, and then we would, the ones that were left standing would end up Mr G's <laughs> Sunday night. And then, uh, obviously, Monday off, and then back at training Tuesday, preparing for the following game, you know. so But it didn't matter... What 11 went on the park, they knew that would stick together, would fight each other's corner, and no matter if it was Forfar or Rangers where we were playing, you know, it was, let's go out, we've got a job to do, let's get the job done, and then move on to the next game. Okay, just to finish off, finish off obviously today is um, uh, a day of celebration, but I also think, John, it's a, it's a day of remembrance for you guys as well, because obviously, your great pal Neil Cooper is no longer with us. So um, it, it, I think it, it's very important to remember Neil's contribution during that whole campaign as well, isn't it? Oh, yes. Um, but, well, you probably might see, I'll just stand up. I've, uh, I'm getting a bit emotional here, but uh, okay. on the, the 2018 uh, the end of season dinner at the, the Aberdeen Exhibition Centre, um, it started the dinner, Neil. Um, he won the heads and tails, which we knew it, you know, when we saw him getting up on the stage with the oh no, guaranteed he's getting on it. And there's <laughs> 700 odd people at this dinner, you know, so, but it was, it was so funny, you know, Tati or Tati being Tati sort of thing. 
Uh, little did we know what was going to happen to him later that year, you know, which it was, dev- it was devastating for everybody. But uh, anyway, um, his family asked um, if I would uh, organise a team to participate in the AFC Gulf uh, or, uh, day later that year because that's what Neil won for the Heads and Tails Prize. So uh, myself, uh, his close friends, Paul Alexander and Alan Ross uh, played along with his sister's husband, uh, Adrian. So the four of us went out, Paul organised the shirts which I've got on, as I say, it's the Team Tarty and you maybe see the back, just bear me a second, it's got the number four and Cooper on the back. So uh, I just thought tonight, you know, because he was a big part of the squad, uh, and uh, we, uh, we we miss him dearly. So uh, I know, sorry, I know he'll be up there watching, watching. He'll be so proud of you, John. He'll be so yeah. proud of you guys. Yeah. You know, Listen, I want to leave it there. Thank you so much for coming on. It's honestly, John, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you as it always is. And thank you for talking about Neil in such a, a, a lovely way as well. Yeah. God bless, mate, yeah. God bless. Thanks, Thanks. I think it's quite obvious to everybody that's just watched that interview what Neil Cooper still means to his pals and to his former teammates. And he's still very, very much missed by everybody that was connected with Aberdeen Football Club and football as a whole. Some of you have been in touch um, since we came on air, not long until we go off air. If you're just joining us, I'll bring you the team news in just a moment. But some of you have asked about the little studio that I've built here, um, just down the road from where I live. Um, A lot of folk have asked about this. Now, outside my children and my wife, that is my most prized possession. That is Sir Alex Ferguson's club tracksuit from the Cup Winners' Cup Final. That was given to me a number of years ago by Billy Stark, and it is a prized possession. Um, Obviously, that's a poster from my latest book, European Nights, plug, plug. And just in the corner there, here we go. That's, uh, sorry, the light's shining on that a little bit, but that's um, a D7 creative on Twitter, uh, Willie Miller poster, because he's my hero. Um, Up here, just behind me, behind my head here, that's uh, Andrew Considine's pennant from his testimonial a few years ago and a few folk have asked about this that's obviously the lego bus that the club um brought out after we won the league cup and up there is a model airplane that used to belong to my father he worked for a company called lloyd's international it's where we met my mum um so i thought it'd just be nice to have it in the studio and if you have asked about this you can't quite see on the other side but i've got a playmobile aston martin that my wife bought for my christmas last year and it's a goldfinger so it's the, the baddies from Goldfinger and James Bond sits in the car. There you go. Um, now, at this point in proceedings, I would just like to have a quick word of thanks to the guys that support me here on ABTV. Salt Time Energy, who have been with me from day one. Huge thanks as all ever to Mike Logie and to Craig Cameron leading the way in the oil industry. And to my new pals at Lux Scott, a jet class luxury vehicle company and if you're looking to go anywhere in style those are your guys there's the contact details and they are on social media as well give them a follow okay if you're just joining us just before we say goodbye let's just very quickly confirm the team news for tonight the game against St. Johnson coming up in 15 minutes or so. So Jim Goodwin made three changes. Johnny Hayes is out. In comes Adam Montgomery. Marley Watkins has a niggle. In comes 19-year-old Michael Ruth for his first on star and his fourth Aberdeen appearance. And Ross McCrory has concussion protocol. He misses out and Funzo Ojo comes in. And just let me bring the camera back in. Um, and there was, you would have noticed a couple of substitutions there. Uh, 16-year-old Dylan Loban and 17-year-old Liam Harvey are named on the bench tonight as well. They've been impressing the whole season for the under-18s and so much is expected of these boys. Um, okay, a couple of you have uh, got in touch on Facebook. Gavin Duncan, 
who I think is a St Johnston fan, says, Aberdeen will probably win tonight. My team are absolutely rank rotten. Midfield are past it. So, listen guys, thank you so much for getting in touch tonight and thank you so much for all the views that we've had this evening. You've absolutely blown me away by your support, so thank you. Now, there will not be a halftime show tonight and there will not be a post-show tonight, but the aim on Sunday for our final game is to do a preview show um, leading up to the game. I'm then going to try and come on at halftime and then we're going to do a post-show as well to finish off the season on a high and then we'll be going throughout the summer with the special one-on-one -on -one zoom interview productions which we're going to try and do live and put a production around it so you know I've always been writing the blogs well I'm going to take that a step forward now because what I want to do is I want you guys to be interactive while I'm talking to the guest and I think it's better when you can actually see them um, so you can see the emotions on their face and all that sort of stuff um, and sometimes I think that emotion gets lost in the written blogs. So that's the plan for the summer. And then we come back for the start of the new season. So thank you so much for being with me tonight. I've had an absolute blast on Gothenburg Day, as most of you have as well. Thank you for all your support. It's fantastic to see so many views tonight as well. We've gone through the roof since our last productions. So thank you. And all that's left to say is come on, lads. Let's do it tonight. Big three points. Let's have a good performance. And then I will see you again for the review show tomorrow. Take care.